It's a lost world, now extinct, long gone, on the surface, blown away by the tempests of time. But there are some remains. For over 140 million years, they lay hidden deep in the sandstone. These scientists are about to solve the mystery. It makes it tangible. The mists of time are dispelled for a moment and you really feel you missed something special here 140 million years ago. Well, first off, 140 million years is a stretch of time that completely transcends human imagination. But we intend to do all we can to find out what it was that made this place so attractive for predatory dinosaurs. An ordinary common or garden quarry in North Germany. Here, scientists have found hundreds of tracks left by various dinosaurs. Like detectives, they are using all their expertise to piece together a gigantic puzzle. So far, they don't even know all the different kinds of dinosaurs that once walked here. But so many prints in one place is sensational. The area with the petrified tracks must once have been swampy terrain crossed by a huge variety of animals. The tracks of small predator dinosaurs called trudontids are the most sensational find. Some of the tracks are 10 to 12 paces long. The scientists' theories are at best vague. Their dream is to paint as realistic a picture as possible of the animal, to bring it back to life, as it were. Maybe the true tontids look like this, but there's no way of being certain. Each new find in the Orbenkirchen quarry near Hanover causes a stir. Even the best experts know next to nothing about true tontids. If the scientists manage to fill in the blanks, they'll become celebrities. Certainly, it's a, it's a very, very special site with regard to the scale. Uh, you know, I'll have to take a look and let you know. <laughs> yeah, th this is one of the interesting things about the Obernkirchen uh, locality, that you seem to have a high percentage of... Uh, uh, the, the two-toed tracks. In China, we thought we were very lucky to find only, only a few, uh, 10 or 15 tracks in total at several localities. So again, this is a, a surprise. 140 million years ago in the Lower Cretaceous period, the world was a very different place. Two continents had formed, Gondwana and Laurasia. They drifted further and further apart, and the primeval Tethys Ocean between them expanded accordingly. In the region of what is today the North Sea, the climate was humid and tropical. The North Saxon basin was covered by an inland sea. To the west of Hanover, where Obenkirchen is today, there was a lagoon landscape with small sandy islands. A hundred and forty million years ago, things may have looked something like this. Inland seas surrounded by tropical forest. There is ample geological evidence to suggest this is how it was. The tracks in the quarry indicate the animals inhabiting this landscape included large herbivores. The iguanodon is well known. 
they were about 25 feet long and, when fully upright, were anything up to 10 feet tall. Another inhabitant the scientists have identified is the predator, the Allosaurus. They have a fairly accurate idea of what the Allosaurus and the Iguanodons looked like, but the raptor tracks still pose a number of riddles. Annette Richter and Torsten van der Lube from the Hanover State Museum are collecting clues. They painstakingly study every track. The petrified footprints, the only evidence the researchers have. Okay, super. Okay, great. Okay, this is Roman. Okay, so this is Roman, two. Uh, those are the fourth and fifth. These marks are the decisive pointer to the behavior of the animals. That is what makes them so valuable. It's still hard to say how many different tracks there are. We bet against each other and the estimates differ widely. And we've been at it for quite some time now. Of course, taxpayers might ask whether it's worth it. How many new facts are we actually discovering? But we do find out a lot, particularly from the footmarks. Where is the impression deeper? How did the animal actually move? We get plenty of paleobiological data to work on. Up to 25 features can be determined from one track alone the depth of the footprints, the breadth, the angle of the toes. The statistics help the scientists reconstruct the movements of the animals as accurately as possible. Some tracks actually run parallel. From this, the scientists conclude that the raptors cooperated and hunted in pairs. The more we dig up, the more likely we are to strike lucky and come across one that stumbled and fell over. Or we may find traces of a fight or some other unusual event. The more data we have, the better we can ultimately verify the various theories that exist. The speed, size and weight of the animals are things the experts will only be able to determine after highly complex analysis of the tracks. From Monday to Friday, there's the routine work of extracting sandstone from the quarry at Urbankirchen. The scientists only have the weekends, otherwise they'd interfere with normal operations. And they must keep on the right side of owner Klaus Kuster. If they don't, they can say goodbye to their excavations. The Kuster family has owned the quarry for generations. Urbankirchen sandstone is much sought after. It adorns famous churches and castles in Germany, including Cologne Cathedral, the Victory Column in Berlin, and further afield, Amelienburg Castle in Copenhagen. Isolated dinosaur remains have been found in the quarry before, but the new commotion about prehistoric lizards seriously interferes with work patterns in Kuster's quarry. Now we'll see the back end rear up. And over there, you can see the three toes very clearly. Oh, well, we could cover it up again, put it all through the shredder. That would really make me a villain. But then at least it would all be over. Then you'd have gravel, but no dinosaur feet. Either that or auction it off on eBay, see which museums would pay the most. And the last alternative is to preserve it. We'll just have to see, won't we? Klaus Kuster wants a fence put around the site so that no trespassers can get onto his property. He warns the scientists that otherwise he'll destroy the traces. As soon as work in the quarry is over, Annette Richter and her team of voluntary helpers are on site. These honorary archaeologists spend all their weekends here, come rain or shine. Come on, up the ladder, off we go. 
Plattenputzer sind. Ja, yep, the scavengers are back. Und, uh, and it's true, we really do get in the way and we know it. The present arrangement with Klaus Kuster enables us to come here to dig on weekends with a small hand-picked crew. We told them, now listen, this is a very sensitive and unusual situation. We'll be investing a few Sundays here doing a trial excavation. The volunteers are pressed for time. Afraid that the owner might stop the digging, they try to secure and chart every trace as quickly as possible. And there's another snag. Some footprints have blurred outlines and cannot be attributed to any given animal. Other animals have walked over them, destroying the original tracks. Hmm. The depth of the impressions in tracks close to one another tell us something about the relative weight of the animals that left the traces. That kind of information cannot be gleaned from the skeletons alone. The skeletons tell us what they were able to do in terms of their specific physiology. But the tracks tell us exactly what they actually did. Well, what makes the dinosaur track so particularly interesting to me that, that, that this whole idea of that it's fossilized behavior. You can really match up, you have the skeletons, you know what they look like, and then suddenly these, these dead animals really come back to life. They start walking. Bones alone say nothing about the motions and behavior of the prehistoric lizards. But Annette Richter is fully aware that tracks without fossils present just as incomplete a picture. She turns to the Natural History Museum in Berlin, looking for a little help from her friends. Paleontologist Oliver Wings has been excavating in China for years. Recently, a particularly large number of skeletons were found there. In the basement of the dinosaur collection lie the products of excavations dating back a century and more. The remarkable features here remind me of the finds we made on site in China. We found a thigh bone too, but very much bigger than this one. Probably about six feet long. Oliver Wings has recorded his excavations in Outer Mongolia on video. He tells Annette Richter about the extreme conditions in the dust of the desert. <laughs> now here you can see the whole excavation team busily working away in the desert. Annette Richter wants to hear more about Oliver's dinosaur research in China. The excavations lasted over three months, but the paleontologists had to leave their finds behind because of the strict Chinese export regulations. In the course of their excavations along the Silk Road, Oliver Wings and his assistants think it likely that they found a sauropod. You see, they all work the same shift, so let's see if we can find something else. The big herbivores can be anything up to 35 meters long. Animals like the North German raptors have not yet been found in this region. Annette Richter is impressed, but she hasn't really got any further. Given the numerous raptor finds in other parts of China, Oliver encourages her to go out there herself. Here you can immediately see what it is. Oh, you sure can. It's a nice little tooth. It still has a serrated edge, look. That's right, a proper serrated edge, like a steak knife. This was a predator dino, in all probability in an allosaurid, or something very close. Of course, we're looking for truntonded teeth, not allosaurid fangs. They're a bit smaller. The Chinese raptor finds a few years back involved a number of pioneering revelations about the dinosaurs. 
the skeletons are incredibly bird-like in the sense that they have uh, wishbones, they have uh, bony breastplates, they have all these attributes that we see in modern birds. That combined with the specimens that we found in northeastern China, which we can really show that these animals were feathered. And when I say feathered, not just feathered with a downy sort of covering, but feathered with the same sorts of feathers that you would see in a modern bird. It's a crucial insight. If the Orbenkirchen raptors were relatives of the Chinese finds, they were probably also feathered. The feet are the features most likely to prove whether they're related. The North German Truton dids are particularly remarkable for their toes, the second of which was a razor sharp sickle claw that served as a weapon. In China, we hope that when we see these wonderful fossil remnants of the feathered dinosaurs, we'll be able to get a very accurate idea of what our Truton dids actually look like. If the claws of the Chinese raptors and those from urban Kirchen match, it would be proof positive that the North German dinosaurs were also feathered. That means we're going to have to reconstruct their entire habitat. They'd have been small and probably very colorful, bird-like animals. Diner birds, as the Americans call them, they would have ruled the roost here. And at present, the best place to find out is in China. So, Anetta Richter and Torsten van der Lube traveled to Beijing. In recent years, China has become a mecca for paleontologists. They want a first-hand view of the spectacular finds made by their Chinese colleagues. That way they're confident they can establish precisely the outward appearance of their predators. Nice to meet you. Yeah, me too. Nice to meet you. Paleontologist Xing Zhu is one of the world's leading experts on these bird-like dinosaurs. At the Chinese Academy of Sciences, he studies their plumage and their physiology. When we discovered the, the first feathery dinosaur in Liaoning in 1998, 1999, oh, this is a great species, definitely very, very beautiful specimen. So probably this will be my most important discovery in my career. And then next year, I found another new species, and even more important. I said, oh, maybe this is over. This is the end of the... Uh, but at, and then uh, the next year, I had another new discovery. In the preparation room of the Institute, Xing Zhu shows his visitors one of his most famous finds, a petrified baby Truton did. It comes astonishingly close to the idea the scientists have of the North German raptor. So this is the Malon spaceman. Oh! Wow. Want to take a look? The original? Yes. Yes, thank you. Mei Long means peacefully sleeping dragon. There it is. And does indeed have a sickle claw. It is well hidden, but it means that the little predator is a member of the true tondid species, just like the animals from Obenkirchen. The baby animal displays a sleeping posture typical of birds, another indication that the raptors were very similar indeed to present-day birds. Yeah, this is like... It's a wonderfully preserved fossil of a not quite adult Trutondid, and in a sleeping position at that. The poor little fellow was surprised in his sleep, you see. Now we know without doubt that it definitely was Trutondids that left those tracks back home. For Europe, this is in itself a significant find, because there are hardly any Trutondid remains in Europe at all. But Mei Long's European relatives would have been quite a bit larger. Uh, last uh, decade, uh, witnessed the significant advances uh, in our understanding of uh, origin of birds. So now we can tell how dinosaurs evolved into uh, birds. We can tell like uh, when first feather appeared and uh, when flight uh, originated. <laughs> Evolution from dinosaur to bird can be minutely observed at the Tianyu Natural History Museum south of Beijing. Here, hundreds of petrified fossil imprints are exhibited. 
Their physiology, skeletons, claws, and even plumage are well preserved. Some of the ancestors of our present day birds even had teeth. There are some typical flight feathers, you know, large, uh, rigid feathers uh, that uh, we believe it uh, function in flight. And uh, also, their, their feathers are like more downy like, we call downy like feathers, uh, probably insulation, maybe other, other functions. So you see, uh, dinosaurs already have different types of feather on their body. Those specimens provide a very strong evidence to suggest that feathery the leg of feathery foot is a primitive condition for, this, for the group, of, at least for the pair avian. It makes it all so much more tangible, more colorful, more varied. There's more life to it now than there was uh, before. Uh, we've been dramatically confronted with the indications we were looking for. It's as good as you get. It's precisely the confirmation we were hoping for. We got it right here, jumped up and hit us in the eye. <laughs> Speculation has become certainty. The North German raptors really were feathered. And that's not all the scientists have found out. From the remnants and the fossils, they have reconstructed the size of the raptors. They were up to nine feet long and about four foot six in height. They weighed between 60 and 80 pounds, and they were skillful predators. They probably communicated vocally. Their cries may have resembled the cawing of ravens. Like birds, the raptor's large eyes gave them three-dimensional vision. That was probably a major asset for hunting purposes. Only one thing distinguished them from present-day birds. They couldn't fly. But how can the scientists reconstruct the motions and the speed of the raptors? To validate their new insights, they fall back on an old trick widely used in paleobiology. They compare the predatory dinosaurs with a similar animal that still exists today, the emu. Right, here's the enclosure. Okay, thanks. Now, let's take a closer look. It wasn't really smooth enough. There's still a few little bumps in it. You have to roll around a bit first. Yeah, right. Yuck, right to a big fat turd. You have to dig yourself right in. We want the emus from Hanover Zoo to move along this strip of sand, leave their footprints, and then we can see the similarities. Like the raptors, emus can't fly. Experiments like this with living creatures gets us closest to the most probable solution. It's like detective work. Try and get as near as you can to what actually happened. The quality of the soil has a decisive impact on the tracks the birds leave. Wet sand is the only medium that gives a really precise footprint. Come on, you can do it. Don't pussyfoot around. Come on, come on. Oh, oh, actually, that wasn't Curly. He's the big favorite. It was the other one. We have to give him a name as well. Oh, the results are quite respectable. 
Well, actually, no, it's really good. It's excellent. Yeah, yeah, really good. In dry sand, the print is much broader. In wet sand, it's a lot clearer and better defined. If the bird is moving quickly, you see more of the claws than of the toes themselves. You get different imprints with animals crossing different substratas at different speeds. And then you realize that when you're looking at fossil dinosaur footprints, you really always need more than five or six if you really want to draw conclusions from a set of tracks. The emu prints are indeed similar to those of the raptors. From their investigations, the scientists have calculated that the dinosaurs could move at anything up to 30 miles an hour, like emus. But there are obvious differences as well. What we see here is that emus' feet really are quite fleshy. There's plenty of tissue on the undersides of the feet. The dino's feet were probably either less meaty or we've been underestimating just how agile those animals really were. The observations we have collected by looking at the emus help us to understand better how those dino tracks turned out the way they did. It helps to make our understanding that much better. For even more precise motion studies, they use a special camera that takes several hundred pictures per second. This will help to create a three-dimensional view of the raptors. Then there is data from the emu experiment and the analysis of the petrified tracks. Gradually, a graphic picture emerges of the way the raptors moved. Uh, the high -speed oh, those high-speed shots you brought us give us a really good idea of the way the toes come together. I've added that to the animation. They only spread out again when the foot hits the ground, giving the animal support and stopping it from falling over. But there's one essential difference. In motion, the raptors raised their second toe, the razor-sharp sickle claw, to stop the dangerous weapon from getting blunted. It was more or less parallel to this middle toe. When it raised its foot, the claw really went back quite some way. The mobility potential was extreme. This deadly weapon got lost in the course of evolution. In the emu, it's back on the ground again. It makes a whole lot of sense. There are all kinds of forces centered on it. Whether he was attacking very small or very big animals, he could always sink the claw into the prey. These animals are typified by having very, very large claws on the, their, on the second toe of their feet. And there's been a lot of argument in the scientific literature about whether or not these claws were held erect when the animal walked or whether that they were just you know, went down and went into the sediment. So that the more of these tracks we find, like the ones in Korea as well as these, really showed us that when these animals were walking is that they held the big uh, raptorial claw up off of the ground. With the help of 3D animations, they want to get an idea of the entire habitat available to the citizens of Obenkirchen in the Lower Cretaceous period. Among them, the iguanodons that designer Frank Senholtz is working on here. Here you see what we call the texture, that means the body surface, the skin, the inside of the tongue here. And this whole construction is then mounted onto the animal, as it were. And once you've put the texture onto the object, you can put the whole thing onto a turntable and look at it from all sides. So, of course, it'd be great if the scientific background could tell us how close we are to what we're after. Well, in fact, we have something of the kind with us, but I'd say straight away that, by and large, it really is pretty accurate. Well, that's very encouraging. No, it's a very good start indeed. The legs aren't quite as they should be. They're too far apart, both the front ones and the rear ones. They don't square with the tracks that we've been finding. It's the position of the feet. Distances. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Let's, let's see what we can do. More like this? 
Yes, yes, much better. Lots, but that's much better. And at the end, you have a complete film, you see, a complete take or shot, as we say. This is how it looks. You can tell from the final result that there are still some fuzzy edges. Things that real cameras do, we have to imitate artificially, as it were. Well, it's a wonderful thing. Oh, absolutely. To be able to bring things back from the dead, it's really satisfying. It's not something you could have predicted in my childhood back in the 70s. Of course, I hope it makes my scientific colleagues just as happy to see their finds come alive, as it were. I think it must surely be very inspiring. If I try and put myself in their place, I just imagine scrabbling around in some quarry for years with a hammer up to your knees in dust and dirt. And then suddenly, the diners are there, on the screen moving through the landscape that used to be here all that time ago. Uh, for them, it must surely be a personal triumph, one big celebration, and for me too. Once the raptors, armed with their deadly sickle claws, had discovered their prey, the cumbersome inguanodons had little chance of escape. predators, both present day and prehistoric, an open waterhole is the perfect spot for an attack. You wouldn't want to meet them in the dark, or in the daylight for that matter. We humans are simply not strong and agile enough. They can run faster than we can and jump higher. Apart from our intellectual capacities, they were superior to us in every way, and it would have been very bad for your health to come across more than one of them. The quarry owner approaches. The scientists are planning an open day. Annette Richter expects lots of dino fans, good advertising for her work. But now she will need some skillful psychology to get Klaus Koster on her side. Right, before we shake hands or anything, uh, here's some dino grub for us all. Though there aren't any cherries yet. They are in here. Yes, in there, but not on their own. Here, here take some more. As they check out the locality, Annette Richter once again has to fight to get Klaus Kuster to continue tolerating the archaeological digs in the quarry. For a brief moment, their joint dislike of unwanted guests even makes them unexpected allies. <laughs> this is our favorite job here, spending hours telling those onlookers uh, that they're not wanted. As soon as they hear there's something to do with dinosaurs going on here, they grab their kids and hit the road. Yes, it was you I meant. No need to run away. There's a sign down there saying that trespassing isn't allowed, right? Yes, I know, the place is crawling with illiterates that can't read. Sorry? Illiterates is what I said, but you can't go any further. You, you can't get out this way. I've never been here before, but my wife knows her way around here. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. She can't climb up the wall, can she? Well, we'll just go back then. Now, that's a good idea. 
It's always the same. It's always the same tricks, always the same excuses. To a certain extent, I sympathize with them. All these people swarming over his quarry to think that suddenly it belongs to them. We're taxpayers. Sure, we can walk around here. Sure, it belongs to us, they say. But these people have no feeling for the fact that stone is a product, an expensive product, that's expensive to get out of the ground. So there's bound to be some bad feeling. It'd be amazing if there weren't. A change of perspective. A mini helicopter with a camera inside provides Annette Richter and Torsten van der Lubbe with an aerial view of the quarry. They hope that it may show up something like a prevailing direction in which the tracks are pointing. In the last few years, techniques like this have brought about major progress in paleontology. About a century ago, one could have looked at a track and tried to match it with the static structure of a dinosaur foot, and that was about as far as you could go, or you could classify tracks into different types and give them names, but um, as far as biological and biomechanical interpretation goes, uh, a lot of things are possible now that weren't then, and I think that's why tracks are becoming more important as a source of evidence. The aerial views are designed to help the scientists analyze the tracks more systematically, but the outcome is sobering. There is little to be discerned from the maze of tracks. The scientists still don't know how many dinosaurs passed this way altogether. Well, if anything, the view from above makes the confusion bigger. You can see all the toings and froings of all these animals even more clearly. Uh, but there's no prevalent direction, or if there is, we can't make it out. And the view from above reduces the area a whole lot as well. If you have to dig it up, it's really quite a large area, involves a lot of work. Seeing it from above puts it in a different perspective. You suddenly realize that the habitat of all these animals in the prehistoric lagoon was really quite small. Back to the Cretaceous. The traces have given the scientists new insights on the behavior of the herbivores. One theory is that in their quest for food, the big iguanodons covered long distances as they roamed the islands in and around Obenkirchen. Sometimes referred to as the cows of the Cretaceous, they probably made their way along the tropical shores. Obviously, the moist sand and the warm climate of the lagoonscape in the lower Saxon basin provided ideal conditions for the preservation of footprints. A few hundred miles further north, on what is today the North German coast. Not exactly tropical, but still a good place for prehistoric traces with its mud flats, sandy beaches and dunes. A fair approximation of Obenkirchen the way it was 140 million years ago. Annette Richter wants to find out more precisely what the ideal medium for dinosaur traces needs to look like. Accompanied by 3D designer Frank Sendholz, her travels have taken her to the North Sea island of Langeoog. One-legged like a flamingo. Later, I have to translate all these traces into a digital idiom on the computer. So beforehand, I need to know things like what the place looked like at the time, how heavy a dinosaur was, how deep the footprints go, what material they're preserved in, that kind of thing. So it's very important for me to be here and have it all explained to me in scientific terms. I suggest we walk across there in bare feet and then in shoes to see what tracks we leave. Really rolling the foot from heel to toe. Right, and then we'll have a proper look at the place. Really good coming here. Now, that's excellent, an ideal footprint. 
everything you need for a proper diagnosis. The sediment here is really good stuff. It has these very, very thin carpets of algae, diatoms as they're called. They stabilize the whole thing. It's almost like a plaster cast when I imagine it and compare it with the prints in the quarry 150 million years ago. That's incredible. More or less, but it's not quite so clear cut. In the last resort, it's just a little fuzzier. Still, just suppose this footprint were really to be preserved here. What would happen next to preserve it more or less for an eternity? Well, if the tides don't get to it straight away, if the next flood doesn't come up that far, or if the next one after that, then it's easy to imagine how it gradually gets more solid and dries out. And if the next layer of sand covers it and preserves it, then it's on its way. That's how we imagine it. So if I'm lucky, my footprint might be found in 150 million years, always supposing that there are still people around to find it. Yes, except that in six hours the next flood is going to come up and wash it away. But otherwise, yes. Since the Cretaceous period, things have changed quite appreciably, notably the vegetation. Now this is a classic mini dune. And what do we have on it? Grass, grass, grass. Grass, 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 indeed, and all kinds of tiny flowers. Of course, that's not the way it was back then. You mean I can't use all this pretty grass? No, no, absolutely not. But I need plants and some kind or other to make sense of the scene, you know. So what do I do? What can I use instead? Well, if we really try and imagine how it was 140 million years ago, it would have been full of vegetation. Grasses and ferns all over the place. There were lots of trees, a thick forest growing right down to the water's edge. Though the sand islands in the Cretaceous period were much as they are today, the dinosaurs will probably have left their traces in areas covered by standing water. beach, the next flood would have washed away their traces immediately. So something must have ensured that the dinosaur tracks were preserved for all eternity before the wind and weather could blot them out. Probably the prints were half dry or solidified when a sandstorm covered them. They remained preserved, and in the subsequent millions of years, the cumulative weight of new deposits gradually pressed them into stone. Back in the quarry, it's the morning of open day, and owner Klaus Kuster is in one of his moods, and everyone's worried. What was that noise? Oh, it must be him. The scientists will be presenting their finds. Kuster wants publicity for his stone. The media only mention the dinosaurs. So the quarry owner threatens to call the whole thing off. It would be a good thing. Let's just do it one more time. There's a touch of the exclusive about it. Then it's all over, OK? All this constant wheedling just one more time. Well, I'm a woman, you know. Well, sure, but instead of just sticking to our guns and saying no more visitors up there, they can look down from the top, and you, can, you lot can see how far you get down here. Yes, but then he can't exhibit his little trutondids. Geotop day depends on those little trutondids. Geotop day depends on us selling stone. If we don't sell stone and don't get any customers up here, then it's the end of the Dinotrack episode. Klaus Koster has relented once again. Open day can take place as planned. The whole thing will only work if we all pay attention and keep in touch. It was a good thing you told me in advance, otherwise I'd have had a heart attack on the spot. This way I had ten minutes to get my face in shape. He's never been one to mince his words, but I can understand. The raptors living here 140 million years ago laid eggs and hatched them in nests. 
While one part of the herd was out hunting, others kept guard over the baby animals and protected them from predators. Dragonflies and other prey were probably a welcome snack between meals. The quarry in Obenkirchen is filling up nicely. Annette Richter and her volunteers can hardly keep up with the demand for guided tours. Klaus Koster keeps a wary eye on the proceedings, but at least his bulldozers are almost as much of a crowd puller as the dinosaur tracks. The animals roamed this area in much the same way as an ostrich. I can't imitate them. My spinal column, or at least the top part of it, isn't long enough for me to be able to nod my head like that. The tracks are all we have to tell us anything about the behavior of these animals. The bones say nothing about behavior, but from the tracks, you can tell what they actually got up to. Dinosaurs, to me, are the real mythical beasts. You know, as children, we grow up learning about the dragons and the fairy tale animals. Well, dinosaurs to me are the, are the real animals that once lived right here. And what's exciting, they lived right where we all live. Maybe the raptors also lay in wait for the iguanodons at the edge of this waterfall. But they were likely to have been poor swimmers so the herbivores probably didn't need to fear an underwater attack. I think a lot of um, people around the world, particularly those who study tracks, but also those who study behavior and those who are interested in troodontids and their relatives will find this site interesting. So I think it will get a lot of international attention. It's a site that, that shows hundreds and perhaps even thousands, once a site gets expanded, uh, of dinosaur footprints that were made millions and millions of years ago. It's similar in some ways to sites that I've worked on, other sites that I've seen, but it has some very, very unique, very, very special things about it. I'm very much looking forward to visiting it. After months of effort, a solution to the financing problem of the dinosaur tracks has been found. The European Union and the state of Lower Saxony have approved funding. An observation platform is to be put up for the dinosaur fans, thus complying with the quarry owner's most important requirement. Above all, the scientists can carry on with their research undisturbed. Lots of tracks have yet to be evaluated, and new ones are constantly being unearthed. Klaus Koster visits the scientists in their part of the quarry. Rarely have the relations been so cordial. We're just looking to see what's on top of it. If you look here, you'll see that there are proper little reefs all over the place. Even where it says Toots. That's all in your section. We've given that up. So no hard feelings, OK? It's fine with me. Fine with you? Sure. Ernesto Richter's research work has involved a great deal of political negotiation in the wings. Without her agreement with a quarry owner and the funding from the politicians, the sensational dinosaur tracks at Urbenkirchen would long ago have been consigned to the dustbin of history. The next big plan is to organize an international symposium on the site and invite prominent experts to participate. The clues in the sandstone of Urbenkirchen have yielded up many of their secrets. The predators hunted in groups, had plumage, and hence a major resemblance to present-day birds. But they also had teeth, and the raptors couldn't fly either, much as they might have liked to. The only rival they needed to fear was the 40-foot Allosaurus. A 
analysis of the tracks has shown that they sometimes ran parallel to each other, possibly when two of them had both sighted the same potential prey. But maybe they also have their eye on someone else's prey, as in the case of the Allosaurus here. When they were in motion, the second toe, the sickle claw, was kept off the ground. It was only used to attack prey. So this is what things may have looked like 140 million years ago in Obenkirchen, in the North German lowlands. We don't even know how far these tracks extend. We hope that in the course of the coming years, this place will gradually turn into a site for a research center on dinosaur tracks. We're all happy. All the participants I've talked to so far are completely satisfied. And we hope to spend quite a few more years here working together productively and, of course, discovering what other treasures lie hidden here. The finds in Obenkirchen could soon transform North Germany into an El Dorado for dinosaur experts. Particularly if, in the next few years, the scientists working here find more sensational evidence of prehistoric life.